Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hoop. This is a regular weekly message, and today's message is entitled Secret Sins. Secret sins are those sins that we hide, sins that nobody else knows about except for us. We do an exceedingly good job in hiding and concealing those sins, but they're not hidden. They're not camouflaged from the eyes of Almighty God. God knows all and he sees all and will bring all into light at that appointed time of judgment. God will expose blatant sins as well as hidden sins. There is nothing that is concealed that will not be revealed on that day. Let's dive right into our message, Secret Sins. Turn with me please to our scripture found in Psalms 90 verse 8. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. This is a psalm written by Moses, the man of God, who spoke face to face with God and lived. He said that God brings all of our secret sins out into the light of his presence. God is not fooled by our charades, nor is he fooled by us playing church. Just because our sins may only be in our mind or in our thoughts or in our imaginations or done in the dark behind closed doors does not mean that God does not know all about them. Abraham Lincoln said this, you can fool some of the people all of the time and all of the people some of the time, but you cannot fool all of the people all of the time. But here's what I say. I said, you can fool some of the people most of the time, and you can fool most of the people some of the time, but you cannot fool God any of the time. Make no mistake, the scriptures teach us God will not be mocked, and neither can he be deceived. In Psalms 94, the people were doing all kinds of evil. They were proud and boastful, speaking arrogant words and exalting themselves. They were crushing God's people and afflicting his heritage. They were killing the widow and killing the sojourner. They were murdering the fatherless. They were doing all of this in secret. How do we know? Because they said, the Lord does not see, the God of Abraham does not perceive. But just because God does not deal with our sins right away, does not mean he does not know. It does not mean that he does not see. For the last verse in that same Psalm, Psalm 94 verse 23 says, he will bring back on them their iniquity and wipe them out for their wickedness. The Lord our God will wipe them out. There is a day coming, an appointed time when every deed will be recompensed, whether good or whether be evil. Whether done in secret or whether done before the whole world for the whole world to see. Revelation 22 tells us that Jesus is coming back quickly and that his reward is with him. And he will give to every man according to his work, according to his deeds or her deeds. We have this false mental image of an imaginary Jesus who is meek and mild. So meek and mild that he is afraid to address sin. Or that he's so inclusive that he won't address sin. Our new beliefs teach us that God loves us too much to do anything about our sins. Because after all, God understands. For sure, God is love. For sure, God understands. There's no doubt that he loves us dearly. For the word of God says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16 That is great love. Make no mistake about it. No greater love can we find than that our God and creator got off of his eternal, all-powerful throne and died for each one of us, his creation. 
Jesus did everything that was needed for our salvation. Everything we needed to have life and to have life more abundantly. Then he gave it all to us for free. Imagine, for free. There's nothing that we need to do except be obedient. Because we must steward all that he did and all that he has entrusted to us without trampling on his blood. We cannot trample the blood of Jesus and think that we will not have to answer or to pay for it. We need to be obedient to what Jesus has called us to do because he paid everything for us. That is only fair to expect something in return. Why should Jesus pay such a very high price for our salvation and not expect us to have some type of responsibility in return? It makes absolutely no kind of sense. If we know all of this, and if we love Jesus the way that we say that we love Jesus, why do we feel comfortable continuing in our sins? Why do we continually try to arouse his anger with secret sins that we believe will never come to light? Nothing under all the heavens is hidden from God's eyes. Nothing on all of the heavens is hidden from his ears. For he sees all and he hears all and he knows all because he is the omnipotent, almighty, almighty God. Charles H. Spurgeon said that just because you did something wrong and you did not get caught, nor did not suffer the consequences for it, does not mean that it is not wrong. Ah, ye who sin without discovery, be sure your sin will find you out, end of quote. So, if you did something wrong, whether you got caught or whether you were exposed or whether you got away with it without anybody knowing, nobody found out about it, it is still wrong. You are still guilty. Spurgeon gives this example. A railroad servant puts up a wrong signal. There's an accident and is tried and is severely reprimanded. The day before, he put up the wrong signal, but there was no accident, and therefore, no one accused him of his neglect. But it was just the same, accident or no accident. The accident did not make the guilt. It was the deed which made the guilt, not the notoriety, nor yet the consequences of it. He was as guilty the first time as the second time, end of quote. I'm under the same impression as Spurgeon. You are just as guilty for secret sins as for public sins. One does not outweigh the other just because one is known and the other is unknown. Spurgeon goes on to say, and I quote, Do not measure sin by what people say of it. End of quote. It is so, so true. That is a true statement. You get people who have never read a verse of scripture on their own. They never ever read a scripture a day in their life, but yet they want to tell you what is sin and what is not sin, or what is right and what is wrong. I remember I visited a wild turkey bourbon facility in Kentucky several, several years ago, where they keep bourbon for aging and, and and the guy that, that, that oversaw the place, he took us through the warehouses where barrels upon barrels upon barrels of bourbon was stored for aging. Then he took us to a particular barrel where he got a ladle and he dipped it into the bar barrel. And he scooped out some uncut wild turkey and he gave each one a taste and I refused mine. I was a new Christian then and, and I didn't, feel like I should partake in that. And on hearing what, that I was a Christian and did not feel right because I used to be a partier before I came to Jesus and I indulged before Jesus. He said, it's not a sin, but how in the world can someone who does not read his Bible, who does not serve the Lord, Tell me 
what is sin and what is not sin. See, the Bible says for him who knows the right and does it not, for him it is sin. If I'm convicted in myself and I suppress those feelings and I do that thing that I'm convicted of anyway, I've sinned. I've just transgressed my conscience. It's called a secret sin because nobody but me knows that the Holy Spirit has convicted me not to partake. Yet I quenched the leading of the Holy Spirit to fulfill my own lustful desires. I am the one that is guilty. A fall from grace is not an oops, I just kind of happen kind of thing. No, it first begins with a thought in the deepest recess of the mind. That thought is mulled over, and then it's mulled over again, and then again, and then again. It becomes a fantasy, and when acted upon, brings the offender in disgrace. That is why the scriptures encourages us to guard our heart with all diligence. Never was a sin committed that did not start first in the mind or first start in the thoughts of the perpetrator. The warning signs were flashing. The warning bells are going off. There's chaos erupting in the spiritual, but all of that is ignored because the flesh has taken over and the flesh aims to be satisfied. The flesh is hungry and its desire is to be fed and fed it will be when it is in charge. Secret sins are the most dangerous sins of all because they are not only deceive the, on, the onlooker, it does not only deceive the onlooker, but it also deceives he or she who hides those sins as well. See, the hider looks righteous and so spiritual on the outside. He or she is the model Christian. But Jesus refers to them as whitewashed tombs. They appear beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of dead man's bones and all kinds of uncleanness. Have you ever gone for a walk in the woods and seen a large, beautiful, sun-bleached rock made smooth by the wind and the rain, lying unhindered in, the, in nature? Its beauty is just gleaming. It's very beautiful to look at and even feel silky smooth to the touch. It's so attractive that you want to take photographs of it. And you look at the photographs and you marvel at all the different colors plainly displayed in the layers of the rock. You take and you post those beautiful pics on your social media where you garnish several likes and maybe even a comment or two. The rock is really beautiful to look at. But if you were to lift that same rock up and show us under it, that part of the rock that is hidden in the mud, hidden in the dirt, it would show a completely different picture. Creepy, crawly things will be scurrying away from the brilliance of the noonday sun. Worms and insects and hairy things, slimy creatures that we recoil from. We will shrink back in disgust mixed with a little fear and much trepidation. We don't want those crawly things coming crawling towards us or even crawling next to us or even worse, crawling on us. We will drop that rock and we shrink back in disgust. Well, that's how secret sins are. They're covered with something nice, something attractive that has us all fooled. But when the covering is pulled back, and the secret sins are revealed. The truth is exposed. It is a whole different scenery. A spiritual scenery of horror and chaos pursues. And that is how God views it. So rest assured that no sin is hidden from his eyes. But all are naked and exposed in the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13. We are only deceiving ourselves to think that we can get away with our secret vices and thus make it worse for ourselves. Oh, but why, Brother Kennedy? 
Why do secret vices make it worse for ourselves? Because when no one knows, no one can help. When no one knows, no one can point us in the right direction. When no one knows, no one can help fix our aim and get us back on target. You see, if two walk together, they can help each other. If two walk together, they can encourage each other. If two walk together, they can watch out for each other. If two walk together, they can keep each other accountable. But the one who walks alone is left to his or her own devices. We are to be a brother's keeper. And believe me, we need a brother's keeper. But instead, we hide and we lie and we deceive to keep our secret sins secret. We lie and hide and deceive to keep our secret sins hidden. We can condemn those who are doing publicly exactly what we're doing privately, but there's no difference between the two. One is public, one is private, but they're still the same sins with the same consequences. We can call them out and demand that they repent to our own deception. Like the idiom from the poem by Sir Walter Scott says, Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. The God who judges does not slumber, nor does he sleep, but he keeps an accurate record and an accurate account of all that is done and all that is said. But some pious person will ask, if God sees all, and if God hears all, why does he not punish the guilty, but lets them go free? Well, Psalms 103 says, starting at verse 8, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he hide his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our free. He remembers that we are dust. This psalm states that the Lord is merciful and gracious. A merciful and gracious God is he, abounding in steadfast love. His mercies are unending. He is not willing that any should perish, so much so that he does not deal with us according to our sins, nor does he repay us according to our iniquities, but has great compassion on us. He wants us to all come to repentance and forsake our sins and leave off our iniquities, not keep them hidden as secret sins. If we do that, keep our sins hidden, keep our sins secret, how can we find forgiveness? Not only that, but could it cause us not to be heard by God? Do you ever wonder why your prayers are not being answered in a timely manner? The short answer is, there could be secret sins. The psalmist in Psalm 66 verse 18 and 19 says, If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly, God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. The psalmist here is saying that if he saw iniquity in his own heart and did nothing about it, it would hinder his prayers. If he kept it secret, God would not have heard. But because he did not do that, because he did not keep it secret, he cleared his conscience before God, and therefore God listened to his prayer. And not only did God listen, but God answered his prayers. And that is true of all of us. Maybe. We don't see more of our prayers answered because of secret sins. Maybe the prayer is not answered because we cherished iniquity in our hearts. 
In other words, we have entertained sins that we should have been casting up. We have been building up strongholds that we should have been tearing down. We should do like what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Take every thought captive to obey Christ. So, I want to ask you, have you done that? Have you taken captive every thought? Have you taken every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ? Have you accepted him? Accepted Jesus as your own personal savior? If you haven't, let me tell you how. I want to invite you to do that today. Now all you have to do is to ask him. And if you ask, he will answer. Because he that knocks, the door will be open. He that asks will be given. He that seeks will find. So all you gotta do is to knock and ask. Jesus will answer and he'll give you redemption. He will give you eternal life. All you gotta do is to repeat this prayer with me. And if you meet it in your heart, you confess it with your mouth, you will be saved. Repeat this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. I come to you in repentance. Lord, I confess all known sin. And I confess my secret sins. Help me to turn away from them. Help me to forsake my iniquities that I might be forgiven that I might stand pure righteous in your eyes not because I've consent, confessed only but because of the blood of Jesus Christ applied to my life and applied to the sin that I've, that I've committed and I thank you for the power of Jesus' blood that cleanses me, that makes me pure, that makes me holy. Thank you, Jesus, for dying and for raising to life again, that I might live eternally with you. I accept it, Jesus, for it's in your name I pray. Amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And as usual, I want to encourage you whether you're a brand new Christian or whether you've been serving the Lord for many years. If you haven't already, get a Bible. Start reading that Bible. It's good to listen to podcasts and listen to messages and listen to sermons and even listen to scriptures. But you need to take the scriptures yourself and read them, study them, highlight them, memorize them. Get a Bible. Read the Bible for yourself with your own eyes. Then find a church, a Bible-believing church, a church that believes in the power of the Holy Spirit, believes in holiness and righteousness, who has turned away from the darkness, who does not try to, to be a part of the world, try to look like the world. Join that church, not a progressive church, but a holy, righteous church. Be discipled in that church. When Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. And he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter in now to the joy of your Lord. And there you'll be with Jesus and all your family who has accepted him from, from the dawn of time. Because I, I, I read this, this, this thing that the other day that my wife gave me. For you to be born now in this time, over the last 400 years, you'll have more than 4,000 ancestors. And if half of those accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, you don't even know them, they will be there as well. And you'll get to meet your ancestors all the way back to Adam and Eve, everyone who has accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. Wouldn't that be a great time? Wouldn't that be a joyful time? Wouldn't that be a time of uh, the greatest reunion of all times? To get to know 
your loved one, if your parents, your grandparents, great-grandparents, they accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, they will be there. Well, I, I want to say thank you so much for joining us week after week. We appreciate you. We love you. Jesus loves you. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.